I'm Logan Kane. I play bass. I'm Henry Solomon, saxophone. Nice. And together you are? Outside world. world. <laughs> That's pretty fun. nice. Each of you describe to me your earliest jazz memory. Um, wow, yeah, for me it's definitely um, Blue Monk by Thelonious Monk, and I heard it on YouTube. Not on a CD or anything, it was on YouTube watching the video of him play it. Which I think was pretty special because it's like, um, he just, I don't know if you ever watch a video with Lonnie Smoke play, he just has such a cool vibe to him. Um, and especially for that era he played in was very, um, I don't know, it feels like he gave like, uh, he just had a certain like, didn't give a fuck about certain things or, I don't know. It was cool. That was very impressionable for me. Um, I, I, I don't know what my actual first jazz memory is, but the first thing that came to mind was being in eighth grade at lunch and like sitting by myself and listening to giant steps by john coltrane and i just remember hearing it being like this is cool right like this is crazy and cool but i also i had no idea like what the musical implications of that were but it, I just, it was just like a popular jazz track that somehow was on my ipod right. so a lot of it for me was youtube dude win and marsalis live at the house of tribes it was an album Fire. that also had a video on YouTube. I don't know why. It's just, I don't know, it's cool to watch people play, and then I feel like I found about the records later. Mm hmm Definitely. And then when did you first pick up your instrument in your respective instrument? Uh, I started on violin when I was 12, and I was, when we did the auditions for my middle school orchestra, uh, I got last place out of everyone, like last chair. So I switched to bass when I was 12, and that's when I started playing. I started on upright. Damn. It's kind of same with me. Um, I... Um, started on clarinet because it was the lightest and easiest to carry and then it was too hard so I switched to saxophone but then there were lots of saxophone players um, but uh, yeah I guess started in like sixth seventh grade and uh, I feel it's funny I feel like you just saying that about the violin I feel like there's so much like formative uh, process that happens like when in like the school band program where it's like with baritone saxophone like i only started playing baritone because it was the same thing it was like oh there's already alto players so we need this and i was like okay you know it was it was very much like necessity based right it's not like who cares the most it's like what do we need literally you which know, is cool yeah. though i'm band kid for life same and i was i, I was like band. no and i you know i was going to high school in michigan and i had to like carry the baritone like through the snow and shit it was not that tight but now, yeah. <laughs> so then fast forward through high school into college. Um, how did you first meet? We met uh, once one summer at Berkeley when Henry was playing there and I was at the summer program, but it um, doesn't really matter. We met uh, like the first day of college pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul Cornish was also in our class and a bunch of other great people. So it was fun. I remember we like uh, walked over to like go practice for the auditions because we had auditions mm -hmm. the next day. And I remember we all went and we're like, okay, yeah. Like it was immediately like, okay, let's go shed like all of yeah. us. So that was kind of how we met was like uh, in that sort of vibe. Also before, before that we were like DMing because we were like, oh, like, you going to USC? He's like, yeah, like, what are you, okay, like, sick. Yeah. Like, but it was Facebook message. Facebook message. It wasn't DM yet. It I guess, was that, Facebook yeah, I guess message. that's right. It was, yeah, it was yeah. Facebook, Facebook message. And then, uh, <laughs> who are some of the people that you studied with at USC? You can, oh, um, okay. I studied with Bob Mincer. He was, like, a big reason of uh, why I went to USC. Um, but then, yeah, Bob Mincer, Vince Mendoza, Roy McCurdy, um, Russ Fronte, and Dugu Chancellor, Peter Erskine, uh, Jason Goldman, Aron Serfati, right. some other ones too. Yeah, my freshman year I studied privately with uh, Ambrose Akinusery, which was amazing. And then I did all four years with Dark Oles, really incredible Polish bass player. He was like super important to the LA scene. He was like uh, one of Charlie Hayden's main protégés, so that was awesome for me. And then, yeah, we both studied with Vince Mendoza and Peter Erskine and got our butts kicked in a nice loving way <laughs> yeah big time i think our first like collaborating was we would we would go play duo outside next to this statue at usc and we would just be like trio statue 
like right we called it trio with statue, trio with we, statue. Would just, we would just play a lot uh-huh. um that was definitely the first yeah like the computer wasn't even really like a big part of it like i mean i started making music on my computer when i was like 12 but it was never like a very serious thing until later and then like yeah we really started by just really just playing a lot and then um yeah then we were i don't remember exactly how it happened but we were kind of like at a certain point and i don't know if what if we both got to a certain point where we were like we should just make a record with like the fucking like best people like we need to get like jacob man and lewis cole and, like i'm so glad we did that because it was really it gave us something to work towards like for me it was like i practiced for like months up until that point so mm-hmm. it was cool we were kind of like uh setting goals and i think for me at first too it was like will they even say yes like is this even possible I think, yeah, I think we were just like writing music and the, the thing with Lewis and Jacob, I think was like, I think like, yeah, like somehow I forget how I, I like met Lewis at a bowling alley. He was at this gig that I was playing with Brendan Edder and he was just kind of like, yeah, like if you ever want to like play or you ever need a drummer, like hit me up. And so I was just like, I was like yo okay so then me and logan were writing all this music and we were just like oh like do you want to just come by and like read through some music and read through charts and like he brought some music and like everyone kind of brought music and we remember we read through all these songs we've been writing and we were just kind of like oh my god like that sounded fucking good like we should record that and then it was like oh i wonder if they would be down to like record that shit and then we just they were like sure and then we just kind of did it and it was like Right, and it was both of our first albums ever, pretty much, also, which is a big part of it. So we were both writing a lot, and I, yeah, I guess in short, we were both writing a lot, and the opportunity presented itself to do this stuff in a way higher level way than we had ever imagined. So we just kind of went for it. For sure. And I remember there there was a big period of, like, whoa, like, I can't believe that people this good are like down to play with us, you know? <laughs> like, I remember we had, we had that a lot where it was like, oh, I, I, it's crazy that like, you know, like, damn, like, we, yeah, like Logan was saying, practicing, like, we both were like, shit, we got to like really practice for this. So it's not, you know, embarrassing to be playing with these guys and yeah. on our own music and, you know, anyways, yeah. But Yeah, so basically where were, where were you Right, we recorded them all in uh, Henry Was's basement, who's the drummer of Thumposaurus. And also, yeah, this was all kind of percolating at the same time that Thumposaurus was happening, I actually realized. So, mm-hmm. um, which was also like kind of the point where I was starting to get serious about electric bass. I actually wasn't serious about it yet, but um, we recorded in Henry Was's basement. That was like a friendship that we had, you know, been, uh, I don't know, yeah. building. Yeah. And then he um, mixed it too. He mixed it too. Yep. Yeah. Um, it definitely felt like it was just like, oh yeah, he was the only like, the only person we knew that had the possibility of recording anything outside of just like renting a studio. And like we had been, yeah, we had just been going there to like do yeah. rehearsals and stuff. I don't know why we decided to do it that way. We were just kind of like, let's do it in Henry's basement, and then we did it, and then it yeah. was, but it was it was cool. Like it turned out good. Definitely. Yeah. Right. I feel like the first one was almost more production in like an arranging sense. Mm -hmm. Like Henry was starting to add a lot of woodwinds here, like pretty woodwinds in certain parts. And that was like, I feel like it was a little more like, yeah, arranging based as opposed to really like electronic. But there was like some things that were like groundbreaking to us. Like at the beginning of Let's Be Friends, it's like, oh, there's like a little filter on there. Of, like, you know, so I think we were already thinking yeah, like, like, whoa, that is so cool. Which like, it still is, is to me. So it's, know? I love that, that we did that. So to me, it's definitely um, like interesting that it started that way. We were, we were already being like, how can we take this music we love and like do something different and new? I think that was always like a, um, at the crux of what we wanted to do. Yeah. I actually, at least for me, like I don't even think like the production element, none of the real, like all of the stuff was pretty much recorded live, like in, like on the day. And then we had maybe like one overdub day, but like, I didn't even have the files on my computer. Remember? Like we, we would go to Henry's house and like, we did all the overdubs like there. 
because i i like yeah. didn't i maybe like recorded the woodwinds by myself but like everything else like the synth bay like the extra keyboards and stuff i think was in like the guitar was literally just like in the the side room at henry's and like i don't think we were really like in logic or in the daw like doing stuff it was very much like okay we just sat there and like tracked some extra things and that was it yeah yeah so that's why i say more arranging i think it was more i, I guess with the yeah. exception of la boys and nyc which that is, one was that like was totally Henry on my laptop, laptop track. Yeah. but that and that also i think i made that like later on and i was like oh should we throw this on there like okay you know so The oldest song. Mm. I have a song from freshman year of college on there. Actually, mo- a lot of them are from freshman year of college. So what's same, that? Same. Same. 2014. 2014. Yeah, 2014. And then when did Outside World War come out? Came out in 2017. 2017. Or no, 2018. Although we recorded it, it took a long time to finish, but we recorded it in like January of 2017, I think. Yeah. And right. then it didn't come out until like march 2018 right and we had a lot of tunes like both of us were writing quite a lot so we really just yeah. picked like the gems there were yeah there um, were a lot that we recorded too and didn't use i think yeah there's at least a few of those um yeah what are your favorite qualities about each other oh uh, mm. um i love like i think there's musically and personally but i love like henry even to this day like is very good about i tend to be like okay like I like throw a ton of paint on the canvas and then it's like, cool, I did it. And Henry's very good about being like, well, what if we like, what if we tried it this way or like doing like, he's very um, good about being like, uh, not getting too attached and like trying to like, con- to like, you know, keep going with something like, which I really appreciate. Mm. Um, love. I've always loved his saxophone playing. It's really cool. He plays all the saxophones so well, and like all the doubles is always cool. And um, I don't know why we were just fast friends. Like we both like fucking Legos and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it is funny i feel like we, me and logan definitely just instantly were like all right that's my dog right there um from like kind of the beginning and um yeah i think i mean yeah musically logan definitely has this like fearlessness that i think people like the world needs more of like you know there's like absolutely no hesitation or um or like kind of questioning like logan's just very like you're just getting straight to it and it's always like maximum energy and like intensity which i think is you know yeah just the world needs more of that for sure definitely That's a great question. Did we yeah. did we do Outside World Two after we did our solo albums? Head Crunch. Yes. Wait. Or was it before? We recorded it before the stuff came out, but it we came out it after. after. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how much it was like. Yeah. Like we're jumping into another one, but like it definitely made sense to do another one at a certain point. Like same with this one. Like we had started to like send some. So me and Henry has always had a nice like just texting songs back and forth which I've always really valued with him. And like, there's always was a certain point in that dialogue when we were like, okay, I feel like we have like enough tunes and then we would start to get organized with it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it wasn't a very verbal thing. I think a lot of times it was like, okay, yeah, like now it's time, you know, <laughs> which is, yeah, kind of funny. but it was definitely a big part of on the, of our like point of our musical journey when we had really like both really dug into our solo concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, which like when I made Open Eyes the Boy Phoenix and Henry made Nighttime Head Crunch. So I feel like those were like kind of changed us as people. So that was, you know, once we had done that, you know, it was for sure. Yeah. The album was different. Yeah. I also think a big part of the whole process for like what outside world has become is like just us getting together and like reading new music that we have, are writing. And I think just all of our friends and just the whole, kind of scene of jazz musicians in LA and probably everywhere, but like here specifically too, it's like a lot of, like a lot of the times, you know, it's kind of a thing. People get, just get together and read down new music and like print out sheet music and everyone just kind of sight reads it just to like hear what it sounds like with a band playing it as opposed to like just in the demo in the computer on Sibelius or logic or whatever. So we were doing that a lot too. And then also we were playing in, 
um, ensembles at school where we were playing a lot of this music too with, with the groups there. And so, yeah, we were just getting a lot of chances to hear what the music sounded like. And then that helped kind of narrow down the process of like, okay, this is, this would be cool to record. Um, yeah. Right. For outside, for outside world too, I think that was, but yeah, we recorded that in November of 2019 and then, um, kind of finished the recording and mixing over the next like year. And it came out December, 2020. So my question is, what do you think makes a song an outside world song? Because also, I'm sure you guys can collaborate and it doesn't feel like an outside world song. So what makes something an outside world? Yeah, I think I think um, something we got, we got to mention is that me and Logan instantly had, like, kind of bonded over the music that we grew up listening to and the music that we liked. And a lot of that was, like, pop punk and just regular punk and all kinds of, like... You know, and I think the rock stuff was like we were both very interested kind of right away when we met of like sort of writing music that felt like it mixed our like jazz background with some of this more like high energy like rock music. And so I think a lot of the outside world songs sort of have that energy behind it. And uh, that sort to me that like really feels like it characterizes a lot of the outside world songs as they have this kind of like i don't know would you say like rock sensibility right. in yeah i would say but i would say yeah what makes it outside world is that it it is instrumental jazz music that is treated with the exact same intent as like you know like a great rock record like henry's talking about or like you know like crazy Beatles album or something or like I don't know like um but it's hard to really say it's not really genre wise because the album is super like especially the new one is crazy all over the place but yeah I'd say it's instrumental jazz music that we're trying to take into a different like sonic territory that mm -hmm. matches other records we like totally that's a yeah that's a great way to put it for sure um follow up outside world three which releases April 5th 2024 um how did this project come together what is it about and what are things about it that you like as a kind of like continuation of this series? Mm. I mean, I think it's cool because it's parts of it are a bit archival. Like it's some of my tunes that Henry was like, we should really like work on those. Like I'm a bird is something I had from sophomore year of college. And we actually used the bass take from sophomore year. And my bass, like the Jack at that point was, was broken. Um, on the take and like i still had the file on my computer so we used that um so that is very archival whereas i also wrote like tacos tammy because i was like all right i'm gonna write like a totally fucked up crazy song for this so that's also like one of the newest things i had written at that point so um it felt very intentional i feel like the last two were like we had a bunch of songs around that we were like okay these are now going to be for outside world but this third one was really like we we're like writing for this project like we know what we want to do with this so that is part of what it's about is like really being intentional about it and it's also the first one where i think we decided kind of that the band name should be outside world so i mean yeah it's intentional in that way that it was like we're gonna make outside world album mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's hard to say like what it's about per se, but it's kind of just, you know, for me, like my sort of mantra with just making music in general is just like, I, you know, really thinking about all the music that I heard growing up and just even still that like really inspires me and makes me feel excited about life and excited about the future and just kind of like trying to create that same experience for anyone else who may listen to it and just also like a feeling like oh there's music out there that is not just what you hear con like constantly you know on the radio or in public or wherever and it's like there's things you can listen to that are like in this other universe of sonic possibilities and uh sometimes like yeah hearing things that are at kind of outside of this of the the everyday or it's like really inspiring and makes you feel like there's you know potentials and possibilities and um more to life than just what's in front of you 
So I think that, you know, really is a big part of, you know, the music that gets written for this project. Right. I mean, I guess it's kind of cheesy, but it's like really like just trying to let people into our world. You know, it's kind of funny that it's the name of the project, but, um, and the fact that anyone is interested in that is always a huge blessing. So, mm -hmm. definitely. I think that's immediately striking about the outside world project is how robust and signature the visual element is from the, the covers to like a lot of the like typefaces designs all the way to the music videos. So, I want to talk about the development of the visual style for Outside World and also the involvement of Pedro Bayo, who's been a collaborator. Um, from starting from the second uh, project mm -hmm. right well i mean the first album which i still kind of consider our logo even though we don't use it a lot i think we made it on like microsoft paint style software it was on sketch sketch which is like apple version yeah. of and microsoft paint. one day i was just like what if we had like a rainbow but it was like one blue eye and one brown eye so it was like the both of us and we were like yeah like, yeah well, like wasn't even like a contrived like we didn't even try very hard at it yeah. and then pedro bayo who um made the visuals for outside world two and three took that and made it just this incredible cover for outside world two and like totally took it way beyond what we would have ever thought um from mm -hmm. just like a very simple sketch file um he painted it uh by hand and then took it into photoshop and then turned it into this like beautiful like rainbow bear mm -hmm. thing um so, I mean, him doing that, I think, definitely stepped up the visuals for our project forever. Like, right, just right there. Also, Pedro's part of this, like, very exciting collective of visual artists from Miami. And at the time, he was working um, in this uh, kind of collective called Bisc Corp, Bisc Corporation, which is, like, Millie, Millie Cohen and... Trevor Bazile and Lena Redford, Harrison Fishman, like all these people that are just making like amazing stuff. And so Pedro was like, um, kind of, you know, basically just came to us and was like, okay, like this needs to be, uh, like this needs, this, the visuals for this need to be like as extra as the music. And it was, and he like really was like, okay, hits like this music video like there's gonna be a parrot and it's gonna be lost and logan is gonna have to like hack into the future and to, to save this parrot and then it's gonna like teleport to the desert like through a bong rip into a Lionel messi poster and it was we were just like <laughs> we were like okay all, like was, this is yeah. like this is you know feels like the right um thing but yeah i guess the reason i brought up the miami stuff is because um uh jp Abascal, the also amazing graphic designer, he made these like really great title, like title uh, cards for all the songs that are in the the Spotify canvases. Um, so I, yeah, I just wanted to shout him out because those are amazing. But yeah, there's just Pedro had this network of people that all were really um, amazing and inspiring to work with. Right, for the, the Miami visuals. connection for some reason was just so strong, and I didn't. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know about it. It was kudos to Henry for being like, I think we should work with these people. Um, so you knew them from high school and stuff. So, um, yeah. And then the video, like we went to, uh, it was really funny. I remember we were running around Joshua tree national park with like this giant video camera, which you're not supposed to do. And it was like a big, like movie style camera page. And he was literally chasing me around the desert. And I remember that, um, this national park ranger pulled up and was like, yo, you're absolutely, first of all, you're not supposed to like be at, like just pulled off on the road here and like you're not allowed to film and pedro just right away was like yeah it's a school project we're film students and right away i was like oh my god this guy knows what he's doing um he was yeah. like yeah no it's not gonna go anywhere it's literally just gonna be sent to my teacher and the, <laughs> and the park ranger was like all right okay like you could keep it it's fine so at that moment everything could have been deleted um yeah which was pretty funny so that was just a funny memory <laughs> yeah so outside world three um features an amazing cast of friends and collaborators, mentors, everyone from Roy McCurdy, David Binney, Luca Mendoza, Paul Cornish, Benjamin Ring. So can you just talk about some of these collaborators? Right. So Outside World 3 um, features four generations of jazz musicians. Some of them are, I guess we're lucky to call all of them kind of our peers or colleagues at this point, but some of them are like our age or younger. You have Ben Ring, Luca yeah. Mendoza, and Paul Cornish, and Chris Fishman. 
um, mm -hmm. all some of our, you know, have pushed us also to be better musicians, even though they're our age. And then you have Lewis Cole, um, one step older on the age uh, diagram. Maybe we could put like little like uh, graphics up here. John, then, <laughs> yeah, John Hadamia also. Oh right, John Hadamia too. He was a, um, I think he's like maybe like five to ten years older than us, but he was a mentor at this jazz camp that I went to when I was in, I was like 14 and he was like one of the younger teachers. Um, and I, yeah, he was just always so amazing. Right. And I would watch um, videos of him playing like Freddie Hubbard solo when he was 16, like when I was like 13, like he was a yeah. very legend. Um, okay. I think this would be a really funny graphic if we went like, bah, 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 bah. that'd be really funny. Okay. So on the bottom we have Luca Mendoza, Paul Cornish, Benjamin ring, Chris Fishman, little older, John Hanamia, Lewis Cole, David Benny, Roy McCurdy. Roy McCurdy at the top. At the top. Master. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, all those people we could talk forever about, but they're just an amazing list of collaborators. And um, I think it's really special to have Roy McCurdy on this album, especially because he's played on some absolutely next level stuff you can look up. But as far as like the song that we had him play on, I'm not sure if he's recorded uh, with anyone on a song like that, at least in many years. So. It's Definitely pretty special. not since like the <laughs> 70s Cannonball Adderley or like Blood, Sweat, and Tears probably. Right. So um, um, it was cool. And it was crazy to have him in the studio that day because he, one of his really good friends had just died like the night before. And um, it was one of Henry Solomon's teachers also, which was, which was a bummer. But just he had this beautiful um, like poise about him, even though something so sad had happened. So it was a special, mm -hmm. special day. I also think it's cool to mention like Paul and Ben Ring, like, or Ben Ring is from the Bay Area, which is, we're both also from the Bay Area. And I, like, I met Ben when I was probably like 15. Ben was probably like 14 or 13. And like, you know, Paul I met when I was 16 at the same camp where I met, where I, where John Hadamia was teaching, actually. Paul was like, you know, writing like crazy hard music already we were in putting a group together and i it was like the hardest music i'd ever seen at, up until that point but uh and like luca we met at school but like i had been hearing about him for years because he was just so amazing um and so yeah there's that so it's i think it's cool to have that just like all you know just highlight that all, a lot of these people are you know kind of go way back to like literal like childhood you know even like me and Logan, like we met when we were like 16 at, at this summer program. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just cool. It's cool that there's a community of very young jazz musicians. Right. And also, I guess we could point out that Max uh, Sync mix and mastered it, who was the sound uh, person. Well, I, what do you say? He was the sound. He organized sound for the whole venue and also did sound at the Blue Whale Jazz Club. So mm -hmm. he, we've known him for years and like I slowly became friends with him. Um, at first he was just like, I was like, wow, this sound guy is like amazing. Um, yeah. he was the only person who would walk up and listen to your monitor and just do your monitor for you right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I've never still to this day seen anyone do that, but, um, we've known him for like, 10 years now or something like yeah. eight years. So it's cool that he's now is like, we can work with him in a collaborative sense. Also he, because of just doing sound at the blue whale, like he would, he's been hearing us play since like 2016, since we've been, we were playing at the blue whale. I remember when we both started playing at the blue whale, it was like, Oh my God, like, you know, we were in, we're in LA. It's like our first year. They're like, Oh my God, like what do we got to do to like get to play at the blue whale? And then it was like, Oh, like, like we get to play at the blue whale you know and then we started to like play our own music there and max was kind of just there through this whole like trajectory which is really cool and it's cool that he's you know felt very serendipitous that he can he or he or not i guess the opposite of serendipitous but <laughs> yeah he he kind of heard all these phases of our musical growth and so it's just yeah it's cool that he's on the project too you guys are very different from each other. You have different musical and aesthetic sensibilities. So, can you describe some of the challenges of Carter? Hmm. That's a great question. I feel like this was actually pretty easy overall because me and Henry just kind of handled our own songs, but obviously had like quite a lot to do on each other's um songs so i will say it wasn't a difficulty but there was multiple points like i mentioned earlier where i was like all right i feel like this is done and henry was like 
no, I think that we could go further with this. And it really made the songs quite a lot better. And like the woodwind work he did on I'm a Bird is crazy. It was literally, it was like 25 woodwind tracks. And then he was like, I really think we should add brass. So then I, I ended up writing eight trombone parts for that, which is why it sounds so thick and crazy. So there's like, it's like a little orchestra of winds on that track. So Henry really took that to the next level. So it wasn't difficult, but I would say Henry was good about making sure that like, things got to that next level you know yeah i mean i think with any project like i definitely felt like it was hard to uh, especially with some of the songs that were older it's hard not to kind of have this like sort of demoitis about them you know um so a lot of them you know we both just spent so much time like kind of listening to and crafting and then you know, it got to this point. Also, w- the way that we recorded this one was a lot of different sessions as opposed to the other outside worlds had um, just one day of recording and then that was the whole thing. Yeah, so I think like a, a big challenge process. was like making everything feel co- more cohesive and uh, like sonically glued together, even though we did a lot of different sessions and like different studios too. You're right. It was actually like way more work and we yeah. didn't, we engineered almost all the drums ourselves. There's one track that Riley gear engineered the drums, but we, and, and, uh, <laughs> Kyle Smith, right, Kyle. um, at the heavy duty studio in Burbank, he engineered the two songs with Roy yeah. and Paul. I guess you're um, right. This was actually like way. But yeah. There was, there was a <laughs> lot of different drum sounds and different keyboards and different, just like overall approaches to like how everything came together right some of them are just trio like there's no keyboards at all which you know for outside world three we wanted to have trio on the album right so. right but yeah like some of the guitar sounds are like me and my me and my bedroom and then it's also mixed with guitar sounds from like henry's living room and then also like other so yeah it's actually like every song you're hearing like a lot of different places coming mm-hmm. together and yeah it yeah. was way harder to make actually yeah 10x 10x difficulty <laughs> The concept was there kind of was no concept other than we thought it would be cool to rent a limo and have a bunch of sheet music flying around in it. And then somehow Richard was able to take that and make a whole crazy video out of it. Um, and we filmed that whole video and probably most of it is like, was filmed on like the ride back home like we were like the time with the limo was up yeah and uh we just turned on like the limo had these like crazy lights we didn't even know about like party lights yeah and we just (laughs) turned those on and he pretty much just filmed us like doing some crazy shit with the we had a leaf blower uh yeah that's how the cover (laughs) the cover came together was literally uh logan's girlfriend nicole amazing saxophone player as well but yeah it was literally like in the back with a, a straight up leaf blower in this like tiny limo just like and then the sheets are like we probably had like hundreds of sheets everywhere just like just flying in the air right. and um yeah uh that was the concept was just a situation pretty much and yeah. richard is amazing for being able to weave that into such a cool uh visual you know yeah richard is literally like one of i mean to me he's like one of the goats of this generation of like just visual like he has such a distinct uh identity like you can instantly tell when he's like worked on something which i think is so cool and he's also just very like he's like yeah he's like sherlock holmes or something like he's so quiet and like you just right. he just kind of has this look in his eye like he's up to no good all the time but right. then he filmed the whole thing on one of the i don't know what you call it one of those tiny sony like point and shoot cameras that like you know like your mom takes on vacation or whatever yeah and the whole time he was like oh yeah i'm fucking with like the aperture so it looks all fucked up and like it was like making he was like breaking this like little camera to get the weirdest looking shots and he was being like also there was like <laughs> absolutely no light there's like hardly any light like like a photographer's like worst nightmare in terms of lighting for this like inside the limo and somehow he like made it work um so he he did a great job with almost no direction at all from us so (laughs) yeah it was literally like oh shit we have like 20 more minutes we gotta go home and then most of most of the time was spent trying to shoot the album cover and like the artwork the photos and so we spent like a few hours just like 
leaf blowing the sheets flying in the air and then picking them up and like throwing them again you know it was like a lot of that and then and then we're like oh we have like 20 more minutes like okay rich like <laughs> let's just all get back in you can just we'll just play the album you can just kind of like fuck around and he was just like okay yeah um so something really strong about the album cover i think is the the like tactility of sheet music and like handwritten sheet music and mm-hmm. this feeling of a blur and being on the go and being a traveling musician and having deadlines and having music to learn. Mm -hmm. And um, so would you say that's also a part of kind of the concept? For sure. It feels like our life. And like, if you open the trunk of my car, I actually do. It's like a mess of sheet music. Like there's so much. That's the thing that's actually (laughs) funny. It's, it's, it's kind of this abstract image but in a in a way it's just like an exaggeration of what is actually our reality which is like yeah both of our cars have like sheet music everywhere and uh you know there was there's also a lot of like you know the idea is like we're in this we're in a limo you know we were kind of like what if we were like you know rock stars like going to like carnegie hall for a a show and we're like super late writing the music last minute trying to like get it together and it's like this big mess you know and like logan is like has is like writing like in the shot and then like i'm like looking at my watch like oh like we're late like we're gonna be late and there's like sheet music everywhere you know so i think it's it's kind of just like an exaggerated scenario of like a very real like every day we're driving to gigs with sheet music in the car flying around and we're late and it's like you know yeah. Uh, Birdie told me that there is actually also going to be a compositions book. Right. Um, oh three, yeah. Uh, compositions from the three outside world albums. So talk about that. Yeah, it's going to be a composition book. Um, and I can't. Yeah, it's crazy. I've never had one of those of my own tunes. Um, it feels right somehow though, because it really is just about a decade of work that me and Henry have put mm-hmm. in, and it's kind of our favorite stuff, stuff that we've recorded. And um, it's interesting going back and looking at all the charts. Like it feels like uh, now that I'm 27. Are you? Are you 27? I'm 28. Right. Like uh, it just kind of felt like an okay time to to do that. And uh, yeah, we're excited to have that out in the world also it's cool we've had a lot of people reaching out over the years just like asking for the music for certain songs everybody wants the hits chart all the the time chart yeah so it was very nice to be like okay we're gonna have a way like just a link to send them now as opposed to like let me ask henry see if you can send it to you and then like yeah Yeah. (laughs) but yeah um no it'll be it'll be great you'll be able to like all of the songs where you would want the sheet music you will be able to have the sheet music with this composition book it's like 20 to 30 songs and it's like all the charts you know the way that we wrote them out um so very excited about that um you guys are releasing this album with la jazz label minaret can you describe how you came in contact with minaret first and what minaret means to you right i mean so we played the very first ever minaret show what year was that 2020. Yeah, 2020. And um, when he reached out to us, it was like, oh my God, this sounds amazing. Like, this bill is so crazy. It was with Greg Sonier from, uh, from Deerhoof and um, Nick Reinhardt and Rare Earth Metals was one of the other bands. And um, at that point, I don't think anyone had really, like, approached us about, like, people were, like, interested in our music, but no one had been like, hey, do you want to play as Outside World ever? And we were like, whoa, that sounds awesome. And the show was, like, amazing. And, um it cemented a very nice, uh, it was an amazing first impression that only continued to get better over time, especially with all the work that you have put in uh, to build the label and where it is now. So it's, it feels very full circle to release it with them. Yeah. I remember I met Yousef at Blue Whale, or I think we met at an art show first, but then we met, I, I, I've been seeing Yousef around, but I remember seeing Yousef at a, it was like a some outdoor concert and I was just about to release my solo album nighttime head crunch. And I had been kind of trying to figure out some kind of like merch thing. And immediately Yusef was like, Oh yo, like I got you. Like let's work on this. And he was just very like immediately just trying to support and be helpful and just came through like super huge kind of for no reason really other than just like, excite you know i was like wow this is amazing and then also uh, just yeah minaret in general just feels like it is a really cool very like time it's like 
it's like arriving like on time, you know, because there was the pandemic and then a lot of the, these venues closed and like Yusef kind of just stepped in this role of like providing a solution to the people's need for live music and live concerts, especially with like younger musicians and a, a lot of the amazing young uh, music, younger music that's happening here. Um, and so it's definitely just like an honor to get to be a part of that. And like, I really just believe in the, the mission and just like the trajectory of Minaret and, um, very excited that we get to be a part of just, I really feel like it's going to be something that people look back on and they're like, Oh yeah, that was like a time and place for music in this, you know, day and age. And we both Um, have songs on the Minaret compilation that hasn't been announced yet, but maybe it'll yeah be announced soon and whenever that happens uh, well, there sure. will be some tracks on there it's the last and final speed round of the night okay or of the day let's just say so <laughs> we're gonna basically go through the whole track list and I want each of you to say one word in response to the song I'm a bird dense tunnels <laughs> friends um, air. I'm nostalgic. Tacos tenders. I'm gonna go crazy. Al Pastor. <laughs> Golden age. Uh, beautiful. Gratitude. Fall in, fall out. Uh, circular. Uh, King of New York. Neon groceries. Uh, um, laptop. Um, needles. Street cleaner. Mm. Um, it's right on time. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep laughing because I know you're gonna laugh at my. But I'm just going off. The first thing that comes in my head. Um, uh, Parthenon. Full town express. Mm. Um, diligence. Um. Uh. Making the, uh, I guess it's just one word. Um, uh, train tracks. Late study. Mm. Uh, oh, one word's tough. I'm gonna go hat. Uh, Naruto. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Learning to fly. Ooh. Um, atmospheric. Steve Lehman. Breathing wish. Yeah, breathing wish. <laughs> outro. It's fun. It's a fun outro. I was going to say fun. Yeah. Fun. Fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've reached the end of the interview. Parting thoughts. Um, yeah, thanks so much to everyone who is uh, just either tapping in now or like some of the people who have listened from the very beginning. It's like awesome for us. So definitely a big part of why we continued was the support of um, people who have been tapped in for so long. So thank mm-hmm. you yeah definitely um it's been very cool to just see people reaching out about the new album and people being excited and we're very excited to share and just very grateful we get to do this (laughs) 